Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode three of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Today's episode is the finale in our three-part Ben Franklin's World Launch Spectacular. Today we talk with Richard S. Newman, director of the Library Company of Philadelphia. Rich and I will discuss the past and present efforts of the Library Company to serve the public at large, which Rich will reveal hasn't always been easy for the for the 283-year-old institution. Because in order to meet the needs of the public for each generation over the last 283 years, the library company has had to adapt in the way it operates, collect materials, and offers its materials to the public. Also in this episode, Rich will share his ideas for how the library company can continue to remain relevant to our 21st century digital age. This is a question that many historical institutions, museums, and libraries are asking themselves. In a day where we turn on our iPhones and can't sit through a TV show or dinner without checking our email, Twitter feeds, or whatever, it's tough for a a historic institution to keep people's attentions on its collection. So Rich is going to talk about what he thinks the library company can do in the 21st century digital age to keep the institution relevant. This is a great episode, and I'm excited to share it with you. So here we go. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. We welcome Richard S. Newman, the director of the Library Company of Philadelphia. Rich's research interests include early American, African American, and environmental history. He also has a strong interest in print culture and new media. Rich has authored and edited five books, including The Transformation of American Abolitionism, which was a finalist for the Organization of American Historians' Avery Craven Prize, and Freedom's Prophet, Bishop Richard Allen, the AME Church, and the Black Founding Fathers, which won Forward Magazine's gold medal for biography. As a director of the library company, Rich is interested in exploring ways that the library company can use documents in its collections to empower people in their civic lives and careers. He sees this work as a vital way to connect the institution with Benjamin Franklin's founding ambitions for the nation's first successful library, and now its oldest cultural institution. Welcome to the show, Rich. Thanks, Liz. It's great to be here. Now, I have to say, as an early American historian myself, it sounds like being the director of the Library Company of Philadelphia is a dream job. So what I'd like to know is, is it a dream job, and what types of work you do as the director? Well, you're absolutely right. It is a dream job for anyone who deals with early American history or American history in general. And I kind of pinch myself each morning that I get to get up and come into Ben Franklin's library. It's a wonderful place. I've done research here stretching back to the 1990s, and now to be at the helm is almost beyond words. Um, And it is indeed a wonderful job to do. You do a lot of different things each and every day from fundraising and administration to programming and outreach. And that's the thing that really attracted me to the job is the ability to do more than just teaching, more than just writing. You have the chance at the library company to see what other scholars are working on, to build areas of scholarly interest into the future, to work on exhibitions to work on outreach to K-12 through teachers and undergraduates. And, of course, you get to work with an amazing staff. We have one of the best conservation departments in the country. They do a lot with book repairs and things like that. We have wonderful reference librarians and curators, really talented staff in the print room and the reading room and in uh, the curatorial uh, areas. So it is a delight to come to work each day. I can tell you're really enthusiastic, and I I love the idea that you have to pinch yourself to wake up every morning. 
Oh, yeah. Treat- and, and I'm one of those people that loved being an academic because writing and teaching were what I thought I was destined to do. And so that meant uh, having time off in the summer to do my research and recharge my batteries and having lots of time during the week and on weekends to do my own work. And so at first blush, getting up at nine in the morning and working until five or six was not my cup of tea, but it's great to get here first thing and see what's happening at Ben Franklin's library. And then during the week, see all of the different people who come through and all the different programs that we're engaged in. So it really has been every bit as good as I had hoped it would be. And on July 1st, 2014, the library company celebrated it it's 283 year birthday. So happy belated birthday on that. <laughs> Thank you. How, the library company is a really old institution. And for a library, it just seems like it's been open forever. How has it managed to stay around for so many years? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the belated birthday wish. I have to admit that uh, that was during my transition. I started on June 1st, and with the uh, July 4th holiday, I kind of missed July 1 uh, myself, and so I feel a little guilty now. But you're right, 283 years, particularly in American history terms, is pretty old. And I think the library company's long existence um, – testifies to the dedication that uh, the generations of staff members and board members and investors and users have had to the place. They really believe in the library company's mission, which is all about empowering people with books and pamphlets and bits of information so that they can use these things to uh, rise in society, learn about the past, present, and the future, and to um, inspire themselves on some sort of journey to a different destination. And so I guess you could say that from its beginnings in the 1730s right up to the present, uh, its mission has been the same. It's about using information to change the world. So even when we've been in really challenging economic circumstances, there's always been a group of people that have said, we've got to save the library company. For example, uh, during World War II, uh, we were in a very tough financial position, and actually the Free Library of Philadelphia took us over. If you look in our wow. uh, one of our guidebooks, it says that the librarian of the library company was the Free Library. And in the 1950s, I believe, because we had uh, some really concerned board members who wanted to regain that sense of independence that had defined the library company since Ben Franklin's time, um, we found a way to sell some property, uh, gain our autonomy, and turn ourselves into an independent research library, which we've been largely since the 1950s. But if you think about it, even before then, there was something about the library company's mission that really appealed to the world at large. So during the American Revolution, when delegates from the Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia, the library company opened its doors and said, if all of you political figures need access to a library, to refine your arguments and make the case for or against Britain, well, you can use our stacks. And the same thing happened about a decade later during the Constitutional Convention when delegates came back to Philadelphia and the library company said, hey, if you all want to use our stacks to help you consider a stronger federal government, please do so. And then during the 1790s, we were the de facto Library of Congress when Philadelphia was the nation's temporary capital. So again and again, you can see that people think that the institution's mission lines up with its present and future. People want to save it because it's mattered. Yeah, and we were just talking to your um, colleague, Jim Green, who was telling us that the the library from its beginning started collecting how-to and other practical Mm -hmm. books. And it seems like what you were saying with Congress and whatnot is they were using the library for how, you know, to make a how-to and practical argument. Um, for li- for liberty. So is the library yes. company even today, 283 years later, still a practical library? And if so, Absolutely. Who, who uses it? Well, it's a great question. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I got so excited because I think a lot of people think that a place like the library company is only about 
scholarly research for folks who are concerned with very arcane, if important, matters, you know, highfalutin scholars. And that's certainly the case. We have some of the best scholars in the world coming here to work in our archives. But I just met with a teacher last week in the Philadelphia School District. In Philadelphia, the school district mandates that all students learn about African American history. They can't get out of a Philadelphia high school education without learning about African American history, particularly local black history. And the library company has, through its Afro Americana collection, probably the greatest collection of documents relating to the Africana experience between the 1500s and the early 1900s in North America, if not the world. About 15,000 different items of one sort or another, from images to pamphlets to books, books about um, gaining equality in the United States after the Civil War, books about the struggle against slavery before the Civil War, books about the possibility of returning to African society at some point in the 18th or 19th centuries. So um, we have this great collection, And some teachers have come in here to use it. Um, We've run five different National Endowment for the Humanities summer seminars for K-12 teachers featuring the Afro-Americana collection. And I was talking to this Philadelphia school teacher about bringing a group of 30 to 60 kids here uh, at some point in the fall for our new exhibition on African Americans in the North after the Civil War, and she was really excited about that. She also said that her students have to do National History Day uh, presentations during the fall, and that means they have to go to some archive in the city, and she was wondering if the library company would allow a small group of student researchers to come in with guidance and supervision and use our archives, and I said that would be fantastic. So there's always a way in which uh, a new generation of library company users Uh, discovers the applicability of our resources. During Franklin's time, it was tradesmen who wanted information about the world to rise. During the Revolution, it was folks who needed information on political and social liberty. During the 19th century, it was abolitionists who wanted information on the fight against slavery. And in our own time, it's teachers and scholars who want things that relate to their educational and professional world. So we're always relevant. And so you don't, and it sounds like because you're having the students come in as well, you don't just have to be a teacher or qualified scholar to use your collections. Um, can anybody walk in off the street and, and say, you know, I have a particular interest in this, you know, what do you have that I could look at? Yeah, we're, a, uh, inst- we're an institution that is open to the public at large. We don't charge an admission fee. We never have. Um, way back when, when Ben Franklin started, there was a subscription fee, but still you could get access to our resources uh, by putting up some collateral or something like that. Now what we ask people to do is talk to our curatorial and reference staff to see if their research interests match our holdings. Some people do actually confuse us for the free library, the main public library of Philadelphia. So we're not an open stack library where you can just come in and use anything you want. We're a specialized research library, by and large, where you have to call up our pamphlets and our books and our printed posters. So we want our reference staff to be able to help the public at large and scholars before they become invested. Um, And particularly with younger uh, students, we want to make sure that they understand our policies. These are old documents. They're fragile. We want people to use them, but use them widely. So we do try to teach people even as we invite them in, but we are open to the public at large, and we want to make sure that our collections are relevant. Wow, that's great to know. Um, and, and the other thing that might be interesting to know is um, I am personally curious that the library co- company calls itself the oldest cultural institution in the United States. So when did the library become a cultural, cultural institution and what activities or collections allow it to claim that identity? Well, it's a really good question, and you might say that that's partly marketing, which uh, people should realize is squarely within the Ben Franklin mold. Remember in his autobiography when Ben Franklin was 
uh, a young printer trying to get business. He made sure that people saw him as busy, 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 even if he was just carrying around piles of paper. Um, so this is our way of saying we've been around for a long time and we're very important. But, you know, a cultural institution documents uh, a nation's mores and values and history. And so we've been doing that since the 1730s, and that's longer than any other independent cultural historic institution. The only libraries, for example, that are older than ours are uh, educational libraries, and there are only about four universities with libraries open when the library company took shape in the 1730s. Uh, Harvard, Yale, the College of William and Mary. Mm. Uh, in Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania was not formally born until the 1740s or 1750s. The libraries that existed in town were largely private, and if there were any informal lending libraries, they didn't last long. So the library company has been doing what it's been doing, creating books and allowing people to access information for a long time. And then beyond that, it has been involved in a lot of really important activities from the revolution and the constitution and governance in the late 18th century to the abolitionist movement in the 19th century. But not a lot of people know that uh, in the uh, uh, 20th century, the library company was one of the first archives or institutions to hold an exhibition on African American history and culture in 1969. Oh, wow. hmm. um, it tried to um, show the world that its century long holdings in uh, Africana history were relevant to the emerging civil rights struggle. So in 1969, it gathered a whole bunch of resource and resources and put them on display. And so it was one of the first uh, museums or archival institution, institutions to reach out to the public and say, we have a lot of stuff on African American history. So I think that gives it a certain cachet as a cultural institution. Today, we're doing a lot of exhibitions. I believe you talked to Connie King, who is oh, our uh, amazing uh, chief of reference, and she recently put on an exhibition called That So Gay, which is on through October of 2014, and it documents things relating to gay and lesbian history in the 19th century. And we've had, over the last couple of months, about 1,300 visitors to the exhibition. Most people, when they come in, say, I didn't even realize that you had all of this stuff relating to gay and lesbian history back in the 19th century. And we say, but that's what a cultural institution does. It tries to make itself relevant to new historical and cultural themes. So that's why we think we can claim the title of the nation's oldest cultural institution. Interesting. And it does serve as a cultural institution today. It serves our present-day society by hosting exhibitions like That's So Gay or your African-American yep. exhibit. Interesting. Absolutely. We try to run uh, roughly two exhibits a year. We also have smaller exhibits. So um, in the uh, back hallway behind our main exhibition space, we have four exhibition panels. And that allows us to do mini exhibitions. So right now there's some book binding uh, exhibition oh. stuff, which is really neat. And it illuminates the book binders uh, art. And so people can come and see little mini books that uh, the Delaware chapter of the Book Binders Guild put together uh, for this specific exhibition. And they can see what goes into making a mini book and how creative you can be. And so we've had a lot of people who are involved in the technical side of um, book restoration coming to the library and seeing its relevance too. Very cool. It seems that the library company today is, is a bit progressive. When you think back in, what was it you said, 1969 for the African American exhibit, and then today yep. that's so gay. Why? How did the library company become to be so progressive? Is that part of its mission, or <laughs> is it just the way things have worked out? Well, it's really, I think, a, a tricky but important balancing act for any cultural institution, especially an archive or a library. You know, we really do trade in the power of the past. So 
there's a certain sense in which stability is our calling card. We want to make sure that the things that we've collected and displayed and made available to the world are here for generations to come. So you know, there's a certain conservatism inherent in the library company. But I think each new generation of library company users and managers understands that you have to innovate. So for a long period of time, between, say, the middle of the 19th century and the early 20th century, we were, you know, a de facto public library. And then uh, the city of Philadelphia got too big, and so we couldn't just have anyone come in and take things off the shelf. And after the Second World War, when we redefined ourselves, we became a scholarly research library. But then, you know, during the Civil Rights Movement and after, we saw the wisdom of putting on an exhibitions. And more recently, we've created a series of programs that allow us to fine-tune how we reach out to scholars and the public at large. So we have, in the last couple of years, created a visual uh, visual culture, a visual studies program, in which we really try to emphasize the power of the visual in American history and culture. This fall, for example, that program will be hosting a really amazing exhibition with support from the Pew Foundation dedicated to uh, books for people who were blind or vision impaired. It was an alternative to Braille called the Moon Reading System. And so we have a local artist coming in, working with our staff. So in September and October of 2014, we'll begin some programming uh, that relates to all of these collections that a wonderful book collector named Michael Zinman gave to us dedicated to the moon reading system in the 19th century. So, you know, again, you have new library company uh, administrators, new donors, new users coming in and saying, hey, have you ever thought of doing this? Um, and now under um, my kind of administrative leadership, I'm trying to emphasize K-12 through outreach even more so that we do more with local school teachers than we have in the past. And that, of course, gets kids interested in history even more by bringing them into a, a historic institution where they can see historic items and books and the way people Absolutely. Talk. And, you know, this is what I think is really interesting about being a cultural institution in the digital age because, you know, the digital kind of obliterates the past often. And we have these debates and discussions about how we can revitalize among young people uh, the power of the past or the power of cultural institutions. You see this in the classical music field, right? How are you going to get younger people to sustain and support the symphony orchestra, right? Because lots of the people who go to symphony orchestras, uh, the demographic is older. Um, and so how are you going to replenish that base of supporters? Well, people say you got to have school programs. you got to get people interested in classical and concert music early. you got to give them the excitement of Beethoven and Mozart. you got to get new composers uh, out there into the mix. And so that's something that I think is really important for us, too. We've got to sensitize young people to the power of the past, to the power of original documents, uh, so that when they grow up, they will support a place like the library company and say, yeah, that was really important. I did some research on African Americans in the Civil War there when I was a high school student, and I think it's a really valuable institution. I think that's really, really uh, something we have to work on as we move through the uh, next few decades of the 21st century. So maybe I misspoke. Maybe progressive isn't the right word, but adaptable uh, or, in, or innovative, I mean, which follows along with the legacy of, of Benjamin Franklin as an inventor and a, and a, yeah. a person who thought that's, about that stuff. That's a great way of putting it. I, I would not object to progressive. I would say that progressive is the flip side of the coin that also contains conservative because you're sustaining. But I also like this idea of innovative as our calling card because Ben Franklin was nothing if not innovative. He was uh, technologically sophisticated, always inventing, and I guess you could say that in an idea sense, he was always concerned with the next new idea, not only for uh, the American nation, but for his own library company. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So, yeah, go ahead with innovative. I think it definitely applies here. <laughs> Terrific. Um, 
just to jump back just for a, a, a moment or so on that visual exhibit that you're going to be running mm-hmm. in October, um, can people find information about that on your website? Will you have a series yep. of lectures or a physical exhibit that they can see or both? Yep. Uh, people can go find us online. We're at the library company. If they Google it, um, and we have all sorts of links within our website to the visual culture, visual studies program. Um, we have a blog there. We have online exhibits relating to all manner of topics from African American history to women's history to material culture to ephemera. So there's a lot of things on our website. Um, we're also on Twitter. Um, I believe we are setting up an Instagram account. So there's various ways to find us online and in cyberspace. That's great. And people won't even have to Google it because I'm going to put it in the show notes. So all they have to do is is click. So it's great to know it's there. Click on the link and find us. (laughs) So is there a little known fact about the library company or a service that it (laughs) it provides that might surprise us? Well, there's two things. One is a an exhibition that we held that um, is another one of these first ofs. And the fame of our African-American history exhibit in 1969 often overwhelms this. But 2014 marks the 40th anniversary of one of the first exhibits dedicated to women's history. Oh. In 1974, the library company with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania held an exhibition here called Women, 1500 to 1900. And it was a collection of books and manuscript uh, and print and photo and ephemera information um, relating to women's history. It was on display from April to July of 1974. And it tried to pick up the important story of women in the colonial and revolutionary eras right up through 1900. And it's interesting that this exhibit, too, took shape in an era of upheaval. So you can think about the library company as being what you said before, very innovative and in step with the times. I have the exhibition pamphlet here in front of me, which is graying a little, but I think is still a very powerful exposition of what the curators of that exhibit were trying to do. It says, the new awareness of women's place in history extends not just to heroines, but to all women. In books, films, exhibitions, and on television, the contributions of women are being examined and appreciated. And so now, the exhibition pamphlet continues on, the library company and historical society think it would be great to shine a light on women's history. So this is the 40th anniversary of that exhibit, and we're thinking about ways to maybe do something online to mark that. Oh, that's that's one little known fact about the library company that I think is very powerful. One that is more interesting, um, and I think illuminates the incredible dedication of library company staff, board members, users to this place, is that the ashes of our longtime director, uh, Edwin Wolf, who was here from uh, the 1950s until the 1980s, he was the person that really identified the library company's future in the 20th century as Uh, being linked to scholarly research. He said, you shouldn't be a public library. You should be an independent research library. Um, His ashes are buried in the wall near our front desk. And there's a plaque there to mark the place where he is. And when his daughter comes in to library company functions, she very movingly goes up to the wall and puts her hand on the wall and says, goodbye, daddy. And to me, this just really symbolizes the powerful pull that Franklin's library still has on everyone who comes into touch with it. Wow. That is a, a little known fact. And it's, it's very, <laughs> very cool. I mean, as a historian, yes. the, there are worse places one could be interred exactly. in the library, right? Well, it is funny because I thought 
I knew about this when I was a scholarly researcher and I'd come in here and even when I first started working here a couple of months ago, I thought, I love the place, but I don't know if I would go that far. But I have to say, Ben Franklin has been really doing a number on me, so I've started to think, hmm, that's interesting. I can see why he did that. This place really exerts a powerful pull. Yeah, wow, this has been great. Um, well, Rich, we only have a few minutes left, which means it's time yep. for our time warp. Awesome. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Now, this is a fun segment where we ask our guests a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. But the library company is innovative, so what you know, it seems fitting that we're going to innovate this question a little bit. <laughs> so we're going to offer a twist. Rather than asking you about the past, we'd like to ask you about the future. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So although we do not know what the future will be like, what do you hope the Library Company of Philadelphia is doing 200 years from now? Well, that's another great question. I used to ask a version of this to my history students when I was teaching, and I'd say, I know you think... Early American history is boring, but in two or three hundred years, there's going to be another group of American history students who are going to be studying middle American history in the 21st century, and they're going to be really bored with you all. So have a little humility. Um, so I think about this question a lot. And for the library company, I think 200 years from now, we're going to be doing something like what we're doing now and something like what Benjamin Franklin I had hoped that the library company would be doing when he launched it in 1731, meaning we're going to be projecting information out there into the world. Um, I like to think of the library company as part and parcel of the information revolution that swept over American, Western, and global society from the 1500s to the present. Um, and so in that sense, it doesn't matter if it's one, 200, or 300 years, I'm hopeful that the library company will always find a way to make its collections relevant to a world hungry for information. So now we do that through books and pamphlets. We're interested in digitization and getting more things out there in oh, digital form. Um, but in the future, um, there'll probably be all sorts of new ways to convey our information to the public at large. Um, through your good graces, Liz, we had Google Glass here uh, in July, and that was a real blast. We could see the importance of using new information technologies to talk about our collections. So maybe in the future, there'll be some sort of library company application that can be uh, uploaded onto phones or inserted into glassware, and people will just be able to click on the library company and see all of the things that we have. Maybe they'll be able to channel everything that's being held in the library company now through some sort of visualization process. Maybe there'll be some technology that allows uh, users to not only read through our sources, but to watch reenactments of things, you know, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography or things relating to the revolution. I don't know what it's going to be, but in 200 years, we're still, as the library company, going to be interested in dispensing with information so people can empower themselves and change the world. That's great. I will, for one, will be rooting for you and, uh, <laughs> It'll be interesting. Maybe somebody will pull this episode and when they put together a future library company exhibition, be like, that Rich Newman, he knew what he was talking about. Or, that Rich Newman, he was a little off, but uh, we got close. I, I can know. only hope. That would be great. <laughs> so this has been a great conversation, Rich, and we are really grateful uh, that the library company has taken so much time out of its schedule to uh, speak with us. Um, before we go, can you just tell us what's next for you and for the library company? Well, we're just trying to, here in 2014, build on all of the success, successes we've had over the last couple of years at the library company. So, as I said, we've got some new exhibitions coming down the pipeline. Uh, in the uh, late fall, we'll open up the African American History Exhibit dedicated to free blacks in the North after the Civil War. We have the Moon Reader Exhibit coming up. We always have a new group of fellows and scholars coming through uh, next year. 
In the summer, we're going to launch uh, an exhibit on fashion in Philadelphia in oh. the 18th and 19th centuries. So there's a lot happening at the library company. And for anyone who's interested, drop us a line, send me an email, come and visit, look us up online. We're always willing to uh, and excited to have uh, new people come and visit us. And your and your email address is is right on the website, so people. It's can right find on you. the website. There, you can just go on Perfect. and find me and all of our staff. Great. Well, thank you for your time, Rich, and thank you for joining us here on Ben Franklin's World. Oh, thank you so much, Liz, and thanks for all you do to keep the past alive. Thank you. I'm impressed by how the library company has adapted over time. I love how the leaders of the institution have striven to keep history alive and the work of the library company relevant to our present day needs. I'm also intrigued by the idea of being interred in an archive. I mean, I love researching in manuscript collections and the days I spend in the archives and library, they're among my favorite work days. And although I hope to lead a long and productive life before I have to make my final arrangements, I think going forward, I'm going to keep the idea of being buried in an archive as a, as a choice. You can find information about Rich, plus notes about what we talked about today, on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 003. This concludes our Ben Franklin's World Launch Spectacular series. If you missed the first two episodes, it's okay. You can go back and listen to them at your leisure. And just as a reminder, in episode one, we converse with James N. Green, librarian at the library company. Jim shares information about the history of the Library Company of Philadelphia and about Ben Franklin's role in founding the institution. If you love libraries, this episode is a must because Jim talks about how Ben Franklin's organization of the Library Company led to ideas and models that public libraries use today, like the fine system. Jim's going to talk talks about that in episode one. And in episode two, we talk to Cornelia King, chief of reference at the Library Company. Connie and I chat about how the library company's history exhibitions are put on and interpreted. If you enjoyed today's show, please tell your friends about us. I'm not going to put this show on iTunes or Stitcher until we have a lot of episodes. I want us to get to be known as new and noteworthy. So that's not going to happen until December. So the only way new people will find out about us is if they visit our website, www.benfranklinsworld.com. And that's where they'll discover more about the show and where they can download our episodes. And finally, I'm committed to making this show as, as great as it possibly can. So if you have any suggestions, questions, or comments, please reach out. You can email me at liz at benfranklinsworld.com or send me a tweet to at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.